Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome and thank you for joining us today as our panel of tax and employment law experts discuss the revised emergency wage subsidy, statutory leaves, accommodation obligations, health and safety, and return to work plans. I'm joined today by my partner, Aaron Coos, co-founder of Shared Coos LLP, Kyle Lamont, partner at Thorstensons, working out of the Toronto office, and Ian Humphreys, also a partner at Thorstensons with their Vancouver office. So a little earlier in the day for Ian. Please check out their bios online. I have no doubt that what you will hear today will demonstrate their expertise in the areas that we're discussing. But when you look at the bios, you're going to see that these are experienced, skillful counsel with a far broader area of expertise than just the issues we're discussing today. Our program is an hour long. We'll start with the CEWS, which I know many of our attendees are really keen to hear about and seems to constantly be changing. And the second half, we're going to uh, shift to the employment issues. Uh, Aaron will help us lay out the legal landscape and give some practical guidance on navigating these uncharted waters. As you'll see from our invitation, uh, there is a lot to cover and we have over 1600 registrants for this program. So given our ambitious agenda, we won't be taking questions today, but please do reach out uh, to whomever you work with at either firm. And if you don't already work with one of us, now's your chance, give us a call. So that we make the most of the time, Kyle, I'm going to turn the virtual floor over to you to take us through the revised CEWS and an overview of the July 27th legislative changes. Okay, great. Thank you, Shana. Um, okay, I'm just going to move it to the slides here. There we go. Okay, so we're going to talk about the wage subsidy as a bit of, a, a bit of an update because we've had a whole lot of changes here. So I think that the general purpose of the of the SUS, as we'll call it, or the soft C, is I, I think well known. Uh, it's intended to for employers to subsidize to rehire uh, or to keep employees on their payroll, with the general idea that this is going to make this the whole pandemic less disruptive to our economy if we can maintain the the uh, the, the the connection between employers and employees. Um, before we get into the into the updates, a brief just a brief note on how the subsidy operates. Subsidy operates on a on a, a, an application basis, uh, and where the technically how the payment is made out is it's a refundable tax credit from the CRA that's, that's sent to you uh, when the claim has been made. It's a taxable amount, but because you're going to be spending it on uh, remuneration for employees, then it nets out. But there's an interesting point that we always want to mention is if you're in an industry or or the the employer specifically or in the group, there's shred claims. So a tech company or someone in scientific research or development is making, tech, making claims under the shred program. Uh, these payments uh, can grind as government assistance can grind the ability to access those credits. Okay, a brief overview. So the the initial SUS legislation was released in in April and began operating quite quickly. Uh, it is it it's a massive program. Out of all the programs uh, announced by the by the government, the the SUS certainly in terms of dollar value is by is by far the biggest. Um, in uh, in the summer and these rules came into force as in, in July, there was a, a whole series of most significant there is a whole, it was a wholesale redo of the program so that employers who had any revenue drop during, during periods because of the pandemic could apply and, and get some, some subsidy support. Changes that came through in this, in, in the July legislation, it fall into three categories and we'll go through them. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a couple of what we call previously announced measures, which were really uh, fixes to some technical and uh, unintended results from the original legislation. And then I'll pass it over to Ian and he'll go into some of the substantive changes and, and some of the administrative and consequential changes that we're all dealing with. Um, before we get into it, I wanted to make this, this one point that we're, we're gonna do our best to make it as accessible and hit the high notes here, but this program is very complicated. It, it's, it's huge, it's very broad. There's a lot of defined terms. Um, we just recently saw this tweet from the CRA uh, uh, Twitter handle where they said, oh, it, it's quick and easy, make your application. For many employers, that's, that's not true. We, we even, um, we had a discussion internally whether or not we were going to report the tweet from Twitter to see if they could put one of those fact check symbols in the, symbols in the corner. 
the, the other observation we'll note is that um, the CRA, to its credit, has been quite good at releasing administrative guidance on the program. But because of the, the complexity of the program, that, that guidance is now a massive body of literature. The, the FAQ page itself on the CRA's website uh, for this program is, if you print it out, up to 90 pages. This is a frequently asked question about how to administer the program. So, Let's talk about uh, one of one of the first, and these are these are technical changes here. One is about payroll service providers. When the initial rules came out, you had in order to qualify for the subsidy, you had to have had a payroll account uh, open with the CRA at the beginning of the pandemic, the middle of March. There were a lot of structures in a general corporate group or in a lot of clinic or medical clinic uh, uh, situations where. The employer, as a legal employer, may not have been administering their own payroll account for tax purposes. Uh, in those situations, the rules didn't didn't adapt very well, uh, and then there was discussion with the government, and uh, there was a technical fix put out that if you're in a structure where you have multiple entities and one may be acting as the payroll entity for 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 all of them, or a, a group that's operating a business together is uh, consolidating their payroll. Uh, through a central provider, and uh, now there's rules to deal with that. Next is with respect to uh, amalgamated corporations. So if, if the employer um, uh, undertook some sort of reorganization in 2019 or beginning of 2020 before, before the pandemic hit, um, under the original rules, there was the, you, you could find yourself in a difficult situation when you're looking at the, finding the proper baseline to compare your revenue to in order to justify that you saw it drop if there was a reorganization. So there are some new rules here that if you're in that situation um, are meant to address those unintended consequences, but that reorganization didn't really affect your business. Um, so there, these rules are, are allowed to, to aggregate those amounts for these different entities as they were combined. And Finally, uh, the last point that I'm going to be making before passing it to Ian is uh, about the, the, the definition of baseline remuneration. In the original program, what, uh, how that def so what the, what the baseline remuneration is, is, is your comparable. Your comparable period to show that you had a revenue drop uh, as a result of the pandemic beginning March and for the later period. How that was defined in the original proposals was a, was a basis of a, of a weekly average remuneration during certain periods. Um, the, the intention was to, was to kind of equalize throughout an, uh, throughout an employer, but it caused some unintended consequences, specifically if you had seasonal employees or, or people on leave that would have changed your, your average on a global level. Um, under the new program, the SUS 2.0, we now have a provision where the employer can do a do a more granular um, look through the remuneration on an employee by employee basis. Uh, I'll go to the last slide here. If if there if it would change their claim to go on a more granular basis and say that this employer was in a specific situation during that period, so it's not really the it's not really the appropriate comparator. Um, uh, uh, we should compare to a different period when they were working more regularly. Um, now we have this ability to go into the plan at a more detailed level. Um, I think with that, I'm going to pass it over to Ian and he can get to, to the uh, more specifics. All right. I have just uh, requested control and I will move on to the meat of the presentation being this uh, these substantive changes. Um, and we're going to start with this slide, which um, hopefully conveys the message about how complicated this regime is now uh, and nothing more. <laughs> the, uh, as you can see, this is a good overview of what we're talking about in terms of uh, the new program um, and how that applies across temporal periods. Um, we use the term uh, CEWS 1.0 to talk about the periods that were the subject of our previous webinar, webinar back in April or May. And that's the wage subsidy program that we all know and love, which was complicated enough, uh, but is relatively simple compared to the new regime. We then talk about uh, this odd um, transitional period, which the 
the CRA labeled as a safe harbor period, which is kind of an interim period between uh, CEWS 1.0 and CEWS uh, 2.0. And if you wanted a, an idea of what that safe harbor period represents, it's essentially acknowledgement that as they moved from 1.0 to 2.0, there was a lot of employers who may have made decisions based on the expectation that the 1.0 was program was going to continue. So they really didn't want to prejudice those employers who had made those decisions um, by introducing this new program that may have resulted in a lower subsidy. So the whole idea of a safe harbor period is that you get the best of both worlds. You're, you're either going to calculate your subsidy amount under 1.0 or 2.0. And then the final point um, that I'd make is uh, down at the bottom, which as you can see, the, the 2.0 program uh, as legislated brought us basically to the end of 2000, um, 2020. And in the throne speech, there, there was an announced intention to uh, keep this program going uh, until the summer of 2021. But as of now, we have no details um, uh, about what that's going to look like. Uh, and my only hope is that we stick with a 2.0 firmware. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be hearing from us again in January when we talk about 3.0. So this slide just uh, summarizes the point that I just made, which is that, you know, uh, you're looking at these three different distinct periods and you're looking at um, two formulas. The old formula for those first four periods, uh, which we're now through. Uh, you're looking at both formulas uh, for those transitional or safe harbor uh, periods um, for the July and August period. And then this new formula only um, from August onwards. And I know that looks, uh, it seems like we're talking about old news when we're talking about these March uh, and now transitional periods. But the reality is a lot of employers have held off on applying uh, because of how complex the program is. So all, all of this is still relevant, even the, the old formula. The biggest takeaway uh, that I think everyone should, uh, should have from this change in this program is uh, that the wholesale change um, with the formula is that under the old formula, when you talked about revenue decline, you're talking about the eligibility of the employer to claim the wage subsidy, uh, not their calculation, not the calculation of the amount. So as an employer, you had to meet that 30% or 50% revenue decline, and then your foot was in the door to claim the subsidy. That is not the case with the new formula. The new formula uh, has a very straightforward eligibility framework that doesn't look at revenue decline. And then the revenue decline goes towards the amount of the subsidy that you receive. And to complicate that even further, there's two distinct components of that amount and the revenue decline and how it affects the amount of your subsidy. The base percentage subsidy which is, um, if you wanted to uh, characterize it in simple terms, is simply the uh, basic subsidy that every employer is supposed to get on this program. So if you've got a revenue decline of uh, 1%, 5%, 20%, 30%, 70%, you should be looking at the base uh, percentage subsidy. Uh, the top-up subsidy is, is more of a targeted subsidy towards employers and industries that have had a more significant revenue decline. Uh, and so really uh, only employers that have a, a greater than 50% uh, revenue decline are, are eligible for this top up subsidy. And to complicate things further, your revenue decline calculation for those two uh, distinct components is completely different. Base percentage looks at, uh, in most cases, a year over year monthly decline and top-up subsidy uh, in most cases looks at a year-over-year, three-month tr three trailing average uh, decline. So just another uh, piece of this whole framework that, that creates incredible complexity for, uh, for employers. And then the final component I'd make is, or the final comment I'd make on, uh, you know, overarching um, framework of this formula is that the base percentage subsidy declines over time as we look from uh, September through December. And obviously the public policy objective here is that um, is to wean employers off uh, the wage subsidy. Now, whether that remains the public policy uh, objective as we keep moving forward, we'll see. <laughs>
this is another quite a dense slide, um, but I'll, I'll make um, a couple of comments. Uh, what the numbers here show is basically your, your cap, capped weekly um, subsidy per employee. Um, again, it's in a per employee uh, calculation. And this is the calculus that every employer has to do uh, when they're making decisions going forward. Um, so it, it's complicated, no doubt, but the big, uh, the big picture messaging, which I would say is, okay, if you're an employer who is not eligible for that top up percentage, uh, and again, we were talking about, you know, a threshold of a 50% revenue decline, you're looking at that 0% line on the top up percentage. And assuming you max out on your base percentage, which is dependent on your revenue decline, you're looking at a, a maximum per employee subsidy in most cases of 677, going down to 225 by the end of um, uh, November. Uh, conversely, um, if you're in that high, uh, high, highly impacted uh, segment of the population uh, and you max out both your base percentage uh, and your top up percentage, you're looking at the bottom right corner uh, of that table. And so I'll take you back to the old formula and most people have it in their head that it's the 847 amount per week that you cap out at um, for most employees. And so you look at this and when you speak about winners and losers under the new framework, you can see that the, most people are not gonna hit that 847 amount. Uh, it's really only those couple of segments in the, in the top, uh, bottom, bottom right corner. And, and that's relevant when people are deciding whether to choose the new formula or the old formula in those transitional periods. And what I tell people is in most cases, it would be extremely rare for you to be better off uh, under the new formula because you'd have to fall into that bottom right uh, segment, uh, meaning that you have 70% uh, or 65% or more revenue decline. So that's the high level calculus with the new formula. I would say that the winners are the people who um, didn't qualify um, under the old program. So people with zero to 30% revenue declines uh, with the losers being people with the highest uh, level of, of revenue decline because their amount of subsidy is going to gradually decline. Not only is the calculation of the revenue uh, decline incredibly important now or important and complicated because you have different reference uh, metrics, uh, whether a three month trailing average or a one month trailing average and, and all the different variables that go into your calculation of qualifying revenues. You also have uh, this matrix of decision making with different types of employees. And again, the subsidy is calculated on an employee by employee basis. So you, the chart below attempts to basically summarize, you know, the different categories of employees that you're looking at. Uh, the high level points I make are furloughed employees, employees uh, on paid leave. Under the new framework, they, they've attempted to eliminate that uh, declining benefit. So as I mentioned before, uh, for most employees, the amount of the employer's subsidy is gonna decline over the periods. They did not want that ha to happen for furloughed employees. Uh, because they want to incentivize uh, employers to keep those employees on the payroll. So if an employee or employer was staring down a declining subsidy for their furloughed employees, they might take those furloughed employees and put them on uh, permanent uh, leave. Uh, Non-arms length employees has always been, both under the old formula and the new, there's always been special rules to avoid owner managers um, getting a wage subsidy uh, and suddenly taking a bunch of salary to get that wage subsidy. Uh, so that, that exists both under the old and new formula. And then pay reduced employees. Um, under the old formula, there were rules to basically give a greater subsidy if, um, if an employee had taken a pay reduction as part of the COVID pandemic. That part is disappearing under the new rules. So I think the key point I'd make here is that just remember that it is an employee by employee calculation. And for most employers, they're gonna to have to look at every single employee within their database to, to, come, to come to their calculation. Uh, this was another substantive change and it fell in between, um, you know, uh, what Kyle talked about being the legislative fixes um, and, and substantive change. The reason why it's a substantive change is because this wasn't broadcast before. Everyone knew that this was an issue that needed to get fixed, but uh, legislation had not been released on it. And it, it has to do with the situation of an employer who has purchased or sold assets um, within the last year or so, uh, I call it year and a half. 
And the issue was, say you're an employer who's, who's purchased assets and it purchased maybe in December of 2019, you're now in a situation where you're not comparing apples to apples on your revenue decline because you're comparing your 2020 period with revenues of this business that you acquired uh, versus uh, 2019 revenues that did not include those uh, the, the revenues from that acquired business. Uh, so obviously you were prejudiced under the scenario and you could your, your your business could be in real trouble. You could be in a revenue decline, but you could be showing a revenue uh, increase just because you're not doing an apples to apples comparison. So the solution to that dilemma is basically to include this asset purchase election um, which allows the purchaser uh, and the seller to elect to move uh, or assign the revenue from the prior period, the 2019, from the seller to the buyer for the purposes of calculating the revenue decline. Now, obviously, that is a, a bit of a clunky solution because if you're a purchaser of a business and you, you close that sale you know, 10 or 11 months ago, and you're now going back to the seller hat in hand and say, please, sir, can you sign this election form so that you move your revenue over uh, over to me so I can, I can get a better wage uh, subsidy at your expense? That's going to be difficult to do. Um, and, and so it's not a perfect solution. Um, and the key takeaway we've been telling people is that if you are entering into an asset uh, deal uh, now, you need to consider that as part of your asset purchase agreement um, in terms of a protocol for making that election. Administrative and consequential changes. Uh, there's, as, as can be imagined with the breadth of the changes that occurred, they needed to make some administrative and um, consequential changes to the legislation as well. One of those was the binding effect of elections. So in our first program, we talked about how um, there's a number of elections that employers can make to calculate their revenues. And on some of those elections, if you made it in one period uh, of your application, it bound you for all the remaining periods uh, going forward. And one of those being, you know, if you elected to compare your revenues to January and February of 2020 versus a year over year comparison, that bound you for every single uh, claim uh, that you made going forward. And so there was a recognition that, well, uh, if people have made that election for periods one, two, and three, they would have no idea that of the wholesale changes that were coming in, and they shouldn't be bound by that election for for the new regime. So in, in effect, that's what the change is, is to say, okay, you're bound for the first uh, five periods if you made that election. You can rethink that election for the next uh, four periods, and you'll be bound by the, by whatever you choose in those four, four, in those four periods. Uh, filing deadline uh, under the old legislation, you had to make it a claim by October 1, 2020, obviously reflecting the fact that the program was supposed to roll off uh, around then uh, and it's now been extended. So the filing deadline has been moved up to February 1, 2021. There has also been a change uh, under the old program. If you had an employee who uh, was without remuneration for a 14 day period, that uh, employee was not eligible or compensation paid to that employee was not eligible to be uh, subsidized uh, because of concerns that they were double dipping with CRB and the wage subsidy. With the roll off of the CRB, that, that um, uh, restriction has been eliminated. Uh, finally, for, for certain small segment of employers who normally do their uh, tax um, uh, accounting on a cash method, uh, farmers, which are typically farmers and fishermen, they can elect to use an accrual method, uh, which is going to obviously impact a smaller segment of the employer population. And finally, there was, uh, there's been a um, uh, continuation of the continu continuity rules for revenue declines, meaning that under the old regime, they didn't want people to be penalized for coming out of the recession with revenue inc increases. So if you qualified for a period um, and didn't qualify for the next, you automatically qualified for the next on the strength of your prior period. And there's something similar in these rules um, to that concept. This one is a big one um, and it's, it's very topical because we're starting to see it um, pop up in our files now and over the last couple of weeks which is the administration of the program. And everyone recognized that this was rolled out in a very uh, quick manner um, that was commensurate with 
you know, the emergency of the, of the pandemic. Um, and there was always an expectation that, you know, at a certain point in time, these uh, massive amounts of funds that were being released, there would need to be some sort of standard checks and balances uh, in the form of an audit because the work wasn't being done up front to pre-screen the applications. What has surprised everyone, I think, is the scope of these audits because um, these audit request letters that are now coming out uh, are, are incredibly broad in terms of the types of documents and inf information being sought by the CRA with very tight timelines, uh, 10 to 15 day turnaround periods. So that surprised a lot uh, of practitioners, I think, in terms of the burden that's being placed on employers uh, for what is supposed to be a program to relieve them of burdens. Um, and, and so I think the takeaway from this is that if, for people who haven't uh, made their filings and have had this in a, come up in a couple of situations, expect the audit and prepare all your, prepare all your documentation on the basis that you're gonna have to prepare that prepare this documentation at some point in time. So you may as well do it up front. So in summary, the key takeaways uh, that I think, um, you know, I know we talked through a lot uh, through this last 30 minutes, but the key messages are, you know, if you weren't eligible under the old regime, because you might, uh, as an employer, you might not have had a 30% revenue decline, you need to be considering this program now because uh, you, you will be eligible if you have some form of revenue decline. Uh, the second key takeaway is the complexity. Um, and if you really are seeking to maximize your claim, you need to run multiple, multiple scenarios on each employee and on each revenue computational rule to figure out what is your best claim. Because again, the amount of your decline is going to factor into the amount of money you receive under this new regime. And the number of permutations that can arise in calculating that revenue decline is, is truly uh, astronomical. Um, you might want to consider refiling prior period applications. All of these changes for the most part were retroactive. And so there are scenarios where an employer who already made a claim for the March or April or May um, uh, period uh, and got the subsidy amount, some of these changes might actually increase the amount that you were, uh, that you were eligible for. And there is a refiling process that is now in place. So uh, in, some, in some circumstances, it's worthwhile checking your old applications. And the last one is an important one, um, which is that the wrong calculations for your qualifying revenues can now lead to more severe consequences. And the analogy I make uh, in most cases is that, you know, as practitioners uh, in the old framework, when I had a client who come through and, and was calculating their qualifying revenues, which, which again, uh, can be a very complicated scenario, if you had a 40% revenue decline, I could be, we, you know, we could be pretty confident in saying, well, okay, even if you're wrong on some of these numbers, you're going to meet that 30% threshold test. So it's not going to affect the amount of money you're getting uh, or the amount of money you have to pay back. Because even if you mess up the calculation, you're going to be at a 35% revenue decline. Under the new framework, any, any uh, incorrect calculation is going to feed you in directly to the amount that you get. Um, and so that's what worries me a bit with a number of these applications is that they're, you know, and they are complicated, complicated, uh, calculations that if you're wrong on it, it's good. It can lead to a, a refund scenario. So employers have to be able to, uh, accept and quantify that risk. That, uh, finishes, uh, our, our portion of the presentation, uh, which I hope was, uh, useful for everyone. It is a lot to understand, but that gives you the, the general lay of the land. Uh, Shana, over to you. Looks like Shana's having a mute issue. So Shana, why don't you just move ahead to my slides? I am. Um, I just had one question for um, I just had one question for Ian before we slip over. Ian, you said that there's a seven-page audit sheet that people get and that they ought to preemptively look to start compiling that information. So I'm just gonna throw out to people that it's probably a great idea if for no other reason today than that one to contact your uh, lawyer at Thor so that they can help you start to prepare in advance so you're not facing that 10 to 15 day turnaround. So Aaron, 
over to you to talk about all the fun stuff. Thank you very much. And uh, Shana, I'm going to leave you in control of the slides. Someone's moving you across the <laughs> Well, someone's moving a mouse around, but I know it's not me this time. So I'm gonna keep my hands off my keyboard. So here's what we're gonna cover in the next half hour. Um, I'm not gonna take you through the agenda. You've got it on your screen. We're gonna jump right into the next slide and get to the substance. So remembering that Shana and I practice labor and employment law at a boutique firm in Ontario, um, most of these will be sort of Ontario focused comments when it comes to things like the statutory regime. That said, a lot of the principles, for instance, in terms of things like accommodation, are still relevant across the country, and every jurisdiction will have its own statutory regime. If you're not operating in Ontario, there's still lots of great information here for you, and we're happy to put you in touch through our friends and colleagues at through the Employment Law Alliance with uh, counsel across the country who can provide you with terrific service. So starting first with what is a new since the beginning of COVID, but that wouldn't fit into the slide uh, title, the new uh, emergency leave provisions. And these provisions remain in place uh, for the time being until declared otherwise. So these are going to be in place as long as COVID is considered a declared um, infectious disease. So the infectious disease emergency leave or IDEL, it's a job protected leave like all of the other leaves under the Employment Standards Act. And it's for anyone who is unable to be at work for COVID related reasons. I'm gonna go through what some of those are in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. It is retroactive to January 25th, 2020. So what that means is if somebody was off work as early as January and they were off work for a reason that would now qualify as IDEL leave or IDEL, then we need to consider it job protected leave. So that can be considered, for instance, a period of absenteeism for to do any kind of an absenteeism control problem that would have punitive or disciplinary consequences. So that would be job protected unpaid leave. And again, this will remain in place as long as COVID is considered a designated infectious leave. So as I said, it's available in a variety of circumstances and I'm gonna give you a few examples. So for instance, if you have an employee who has to be in isolation, whether that's quarantine or simply self-isolation in accordance with a public health direction, if the employee needs to provide care or support to a person for COVID related reasons, so that may be a family member that needs to remain in isolation and your employee needs to provide them with some kind of care and support. If the employer directs the employee not to attend work, if we think we might have an outbreak or we're concerned about something else in the workplace that, set, that causes us to say as the employer, we need everyone to stay home for a period of time, that would qualify for the IDEL. I'm sorry, go ahead, Shana. Thanks. This is where we're seeing more and more of these types of requests for the leave, given that we're now into this school year, we're dealing with more and more workplaces returning employees to work. And employees entitled to IDEL, if they needed to support, provide care and support to their child who is at home due to a school or a daycare closure. Now that's distinct from an employee who's made the decision to keep their, or, or, sorry, an employee who's made the decision to keep their child at home. I'm gonna talk about that in a couple of minutes. Here we're talking about a situation where the employee doesn't have the choice, where either a school or a daycare is closed, whether it's permanently because of a, a failure to open or temporarily due to um, perhaps a pot potential COVID outbreak. Um, the IDEL can be taken spor sporadically. It can be for a number of days or weeks. It doesn't have to be taken all at once. Um, and there's no time limit to the amount of IDEL an employee can take. Um, that's unlike some of the other statutory leaves under our Employment Standards Act. So if an employee requests the IDEL, there are some restrictions around the kind of proof we can request of their need for the leave. So for instance, we cannot request medical documentation. That's probably self-evident at this point. Uh, the government doesn't want to put anyone in, in a position of having to attend at a doctor's office or quite frankly take up medical professionals time any more than absolutely necessary. 
Uh, if an employee has been told to remain at home by public health, and that's the reason for their IDEL request, then we are allowed to ask for a copy of the public health directive. If the employee is asking for the IDEL to provide care and support to a young family member, we can ask for non-medical supporting documentation. So for instance, if it's because the school or the daycare has closed, we can ask for supporting documentation showing that the school or daycare is closed. Now, what you see on your screen is other types of emergency leave already available under Ontario's Employment Standards Act, a lot of which will effectively overlap with the reasons for which an employee may, may request the IDEL. For instance, we have sick leave, which is three days of unpaid leave an employee may use for their own illness. Family responsibility leave, three days they may use for a family member's illness. Uh, medical, family medical leave, that's up to 28 weeks if they need to provide care and support to a family member who is critically ill and at risk of dying in the next 26 week period. Family caregiver leave, which is required to provide care and support to a family member with a serious medical condition, and that can be for up to eight weeks. And finally, critical illness leave, also where an employee needs to provide care and support to a critically ill family member, and that can go up to 37 weeks if the family member is a minor child, or up to 17 weeks if the family member is an adult. But the bottom line is that if an employee is asking for any of these types of leave, in relation to COVID, you're better off to simply consider it a request for IDEL because any of the reasons an employee may qualify for any of these leaves, if it's COVID related, they will also qualify for IDEL. So as I said a moment ago, the ability to request an IDEL is different than an ability to request a different work arrangement because for instance, an employee decided they didn't want to send their child back to school when the school year opened, even though the school year or the, the, the uh, child's school was available. So job protected leave provisions don't automatically entitle an employee to, for instance, a work from home arrangement. What it entitles the employee, employee to is a job protected unpaid leave um, we do have to continue benefits during any period of IDEL like we do with all leaves under the Employment Standards Act. If you've got an employee who is requesting a remote work, work arrangement or some kind of other modification to their work arrangements in relation to COVID for reasons to do with, for instance, illness or childcare, uh, if it doesn't qualify for, qualify for an IDEL or they, they don't want to take an IDEL, they want to keep working but just in a different way, we have to treat that as a request for an accommodation. So remember that if an employee makes that choice to keep their child at home, the child's daycare is open, public health has allowed their daycare to be open, the child's school is open for in-class learning, but the employee has simply made the decision that they would prefer to keep their child at home they would prefer to continue to work at home so that they can provide care, support, education, what have you to their child. That is not necessarily something and is very unlikely to be something that would in and of itself qualify them for a family status accommodation. And you hear a little bit of hedging in my voice and I'll tell you why. First of all, we haven't seen any decisions about this yet. Of course, uh, this is all still very new, particularly the return to work piece. And given how, quite frankly, slowly any human rights cases get adjudicated anywhere in the country, um, it's not likely we're going to see any decisions on this for a while. However, what we do have is a large body of case law where human rights tribunals and labor arbitrators have already had to interpret and apply the meaning of family status accommodation. And they generally said it doesn't apply to parental choices, but rather significant parental needs. And so where you're likely to see, see a carve out that would require some kind of an accommodation is if, for instance, the reason the uh, employee's child isn't going back to school is because the employee's child has an underlying health condition that either makes them particularly susceptible to COVID or would be susceptible to much more serious consequences were they, were they to contract COVID. So there may be circumstances where an accommodation in relation to COVID is required, 
on a family status basis, but it's not simply because the employer, employee rather has made a choice. And in that case, they would be required to provide medical documentation to substantiate the need for the leave. An employer is entitled to push back somewhat on such a request. First of all, we are absolutely as employers entitled to the supporting medical documentation that substantiates the need for the leave. But as with all family status uh, accommodation requests, um, we're somewhat limited as to how hard we can push given the evolution of case law over the last couple of years. So for instance, we're not entitled to say to an employee, you're required to exhaust every other possible means of getting your child looked after before coming to us for an accommodation. We are entitled to, as I said, push around the edges a little bit. We're entitled to ask them to explore what other options might be available to them. And we are entitled to look at what other ways there may be to support the accommodation they need. It's not an automatic, the employee gets to work from home. Now, remember, if we're going to raise as an issue the employee's ability to perform effectively from home, the first thing we're likely to hear back is that they have been working from home for some time, if that's the case. And unless we have a documented track record showing that the employee could not effectively do their job from home, it's going to be very difficult to raise that at this stage in response to a family status accommodation request. Another kind of potential accommodation we may see is a request to work from home because of some kind of COVID related anxiety, whether that is anxiety taking public transportation or that's anxiety being physically back in the workplace as we're reopening. COVID related anxiety in and of itself does not invoke the employer's duty to accommodate. Again, we are required, we are entitled rather to require the employee to provide sufficient medical documentation, identifying that the employee has a disability, not simply an anxiety. Now understand anxiety can rise to the level of being a disability, but that's the level to which you would have to rise before the duty to accommodate um, comes into play. And again, at that point, we can look at what accommodations might be available, if it's an issue of the employee being afraid of being around coworkers, could we assign them to an office on their own, for instance? Could we look at other modes of transportation if tra public transportation is the issue? The identification of a disability does not automatically result in the employee's preferred accommodation. And we are entitled to look at other accommodations that would deal with the medical restrictions identified by the employee's treating medical health professional. So we're going to switch gears, I think, a little bit now. Oh, I think we already covered those. So let's go on to the next one, which I think we're going to deal with some health and safety issues. So let's deal with the issues of, around health and safety and work refusals as more and more employers are reopening and more and more employers are instructing their employees rather to return to the workplace. So some basic health and safety information when it comes to learning that you have an employee who is COVID positive. Generally speaking, there is not a requirement to report the fact that there is an, a COVID positive employee to Ontario's Ministry of Labor. However, if there is a connection between the workplace and the employee contracting COVID, that's when there are some reporting obligations. So for instance, if the worker has filed a WSIB claim taking the position that they contracted COVID in the workplace, there's a reporting obligation. If the uh, employee has advised that they were exposed or takes the position rather that they have an occupational illness, which by definition means they contracted it in the workplace, there is a reporting obligation. When you have a reporting obligation to the Ministry of Labor, you also have a reporting obligation to the Joint Health and Safety Committee. There are also some, um, some industries that have their own specific reporting obligations. So obviously make sure that you're familiar with those. But generally speaking, simply the status of having a COVID positive employee does not invoke an obligation to report to the Ministry of Labor. So in terms of work refusals, and obviously for employers who continue to operate through this period, um, you've probably dealt with some of these before. For some of you, this will be new. So an employee may refuse to be at work or remain at work due to a general fear of contracting COVID in the workplace. And in that event, it should be treated as a work refusal under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. 
Just like any other work refusal, you place the employee in a safe area. You investigate with the worker representative of the Joint Health and Safety Committee. If there's a risk, you address it. If no risk, risk exists, then you instruct the employee to return to work. If the employee continues to refuse, that's what's called a stage two refusal. At that point, we have to contact the Ministry of Labor and report it and invite them to come in and investigate. Well, quite frankly, you don't need to invite them to come in. You just have to report it and they will initiate an investigation. Now, the interesting thing with this is what we've experienced so far and have learned from a number of our clients is some ministry personnel take the position that if somebody's not actually at the workplace, for instance, they're calling from home to say they don't wanna come in that day because they're concerned about COVID, that some Ministry of Labor officials will not treat that as a proper, if you will, health and safety work refusal. They take the position that the employee has to be at the workplace. But we've not seen any ministry clear directives or policies on that front. So what we recommend is if this happens, if you have an employee who engages in a work refusal before they've even come to work, take the necessary steps, educate the employee about the steps that have been taken to keep them safe. And then if they continue to refuse, then call the Ministry of Labor and let them tell you that they don't want to engage in an investigation. Don't make that call on your own in case you hit a different inspector that says, yes, they do want to engage in some kind of an investigation. And most of the time, by the way, what we're finding is the investigations are done over the phone. The ministry is asking to speak to the employee at issue where they do investigate, of course, again, generally when someone's at the workplace and they engage in a work refusal, They'll get the employee on the phone, they'll get the employer on the phone, they'll get the worker health and safety rep on the phone, they'll ascertain what's going on and make a decision about whether or not that individual should be required to attend work. So remember that compliance with basic health and safety protocols required by public health is really going to be the table stakes. It's gonna be the absolute minimum you're gonna to have to be able to show in order to refute that there's a valid work refusal. So in other words, if an employee engages in a health and safety work refusal, the very minimum we're gonna to wanna to be able to tell the Ministry of Labor is we have followed all public health directives. So for instance, um, and, and by the way, those change frequently, including as of October 2nd, we have a new directive requiring the wearing of masks in all workplaces that are open with some limited exceptions. For instance, if there's a workplace that has an area that's not open to the public and all employees can remain more than two meters apart, those employees aren't required to wear masks, but otherwise all employees in workplaces who don't have a medical exemption are required to wear masks. So if you are not already having all employees in your workplace who don't fall within those exemptions wearing masks, if there's a health and safety work refusal, the Ministry of Labor official will find it's a valid refusal. And if we don't remedy it, we may even be charged with failing to take every reasonable precaution to protect the health and safety of our workers. So as you are looking at returning your employees to work, we highly recommend you develop a return to work plan and it's gonna be a flexible plan. It's gonna be a living tree. Your plan may not have originally included requiring all employees to wear masks. Well, now it will. So it's something that has to be revisited frequently. Somebody has to be tasked with ensuring that they are monitoring on a daily basis what the public health and Ontario government requirements are. Um, quite frankly, not just requirements, even recommendations and making sure that we are building that into our own internal safety plan. So we want that plan ideally developed before employees return to work. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that whoever's in charge of health and safety in your workplace uh, gives it the thumbs up that it complies with all health and safety protocols and represents all reasonable steps to protect the health and safety of workers in your workplace. So consider employee screening. Again, that is a brand new uh, requirement that was only put in place about 12 days ago. I'm with quite frankly, very little fanfare, which is why someone needs to be tasked with making sure that they're keeping on top of this. We need in place practices to reduce transmission. Do we have adequate washing stations? Do we ha have adequate sanitizing stations? Are employees being provided with appropriate breaks to make sure that they can wash their hands? Who is in charge of frequent disinfection of high touch areas? Things like that. Personal protective equipment, we're strongly recommending 
that employers actually buy that. Sorry, Shannon, can you just take me back? Perfect, thank you. That employers actually buy and supply that themselves. Uh, quite frankly, um, there's arguments that we're required to anyway, but I'm always of the view that even if there's an argument we're not required to, let's do it because that way we can make sure that for frankly, very little cost, um, we are keeping our workers safe and preventing any ability to uh, lawfully refuse to perform work. Again, you'll wanna make sure in terms of requirement, check your jurisdiction because some, some jurisdictions do in fact require the employer to provide all relevant PPE. And do we have protocols in place to make sure that an employee does report if they're ill? What happens if they're ill? What are we asking them to do if they have traveled outside Canada, if they have been in close contact with somebody who is exhibiting symptoms? We know, for instance, just this morning, there was a change in Ontario Public's health, public health's recommendation as to how long people need to quarantine, to self-isolate depending on the circumstances. It's different if somebody has mild symptoms than if they have serious symptoms. Um, I won't even try to recount them for you because there's three different tests that I don't want to risk getting them wrong. All of that to say, make sure that we're current on how long we are asking employees to remain off work if they fall in any other risk categories that would require them to do so. Educate and train your employees on the return to work plan. You don't want people leaving home, coming to work, coming on public transportation if they are experiencing symptoms. Make sure you have something in place that requires your employees to report if they have any COVID symptoms or any other COVID risk factor, such as coming into close contact with somebody who is COVID presumed or COVID positive, such as returning to work from outside Canada, they need to be reporting those things before they leave home in the morning so that you can direct them to the appropriate public health officials for instructions. You don't want them coming to the workplace only to tell you that they're coughing and hacking. And educate employees on the safety measures in place. Our experience with employers so far has been the more educated employees are about the health and safety steps that are being taken by their employer, the less likely they are to engage in a work refusal or other disruptive behavior, potentially seeking an accommodation so they don't have to come to work. They're more comfortable being at work when they understand that their employer, employer has taken their health and safety and by extension, the health and safety of their families very seriously. Consider how you will address uh, a refusal to wear PPE. So if we now have a mask mandate and you have an employee that doesn't fall in one of those exemptions, what will we do if they refuse to wear PPE? If they claim there's a medical exemption, um, that's a place where we can look at whether we can get some medical to support that. So think of those things now, including potentially disciplinary measures, because if somebody is refusing to wear a mask in the workplace, they are creating a health and safety risk to their coworkers. And by the way, even if somebody has a medical exemption from wearing a mask, that does not mean that they have a medical exemption from taking the steps necessary to protect their colleagues. So for instance, just because someone may have a legitimate medical reason they can't wear a mask, which quite frankly are very narrow, it doesn't mean they can't wear a face shield. It doesn't mean that we can't put some kind of other measures in place to protect employees who might need to work near that individual. So think of these things now, think of the logistics in your workplace and how you would address those kinds of issues. And again, as I said, make sure that we have someone tasked with following public health guidelines frequently to make sure that we are always in compliance so that at the end of the day, we know we have taken the baseline measures to protect the health and safety of our workplace, uh, the health and safety of our employees, and make sure that we are avoiding charges from the Ministry of Labor. That's it, Erin. Over to you, Shana. Thank you both so, or all so much. Thank you, Erin, for taking us through. I, um, we thought back, we've talked about this a lot. We thought back in March that these would all be, you know, lear lessons learned come August as we planned our fall vacations. And so I think, you know, we hear the term the new normal a lot and people are definitely adapting, but uh, the changes pop up for employers on a daily basis. And what this program demonstrates again is that whether that's dealing with the people concerns and accommodations, safety is a priority, or how we're paying those people and how we're maintaining our payrolls 
It's just something that the people on this call today, I know are trying to navigate both sides coming at them. So thank you all so much for your insight and your perspective. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. As I said at the outset, we encourage you to contact your Thorstensen's or Sherrod Coos lawyer with whom you work to answer any questions you have. And if you don't work with one of us yet, now's the time. So have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, guys.